Around the World in 80 Days by Jules Verne Chapter 12 In which Phileas Fogg and his companions venture through the forest of Indian, India and what follows. The guide, in order to shorten the distance to be gone over, left to his right the line of the road, and the construction of, of which was still in process. This line, very crooked, owing to the capious ramifications of the Vinda Mountains, did not follow the shortest route, which was Phileas Fogg's interest to take. The Parsi, very familiar with the roads and paths of the country, thought to gain twenty miles by cutting through the forest, and they submitted to him. Phileas Fogg and Sir Francis Camardi plunged their necks in their howdahs and was much shaken up by the rough trot of the elephant, whom his mahout urged to a rapid gait. But they bore it with the peculiar <clears throat> British ap apathy, talking very little and scarcely seeing each other. As for Passepartout, perched upon an animal's back and directly subjected to the swaying from side to side, he took care, upon his master's recommendation, not to keep his tongue between his teeth, <clears throat> as it would have been cut short off. The good fellow, at one time thrown forward on the elephant's neck, and another thrown on the back of his rumps, was making leaps like a clown on a springboard, but he joked and laughed in the midst of its somersaults. From time to time he would take from his bag a lump of sugar, which the intelligent Kuani took the end of its trunk without interrupting for an instant of his regular trot. In two hours' march, the guide stopped the elephant and gave them an hour's rest. The animal devoured branches of trees and shrubs, first having quenched his thirst at the neighboring pond. Sir Francis Camardi did not complain of his heart. He was worn out. Mr. Fogg appeared as if he had just gone to bed. <clears throat> but he's made of iron, said the brigadier general, looking at him with an <clears throat> admiration. Of wrought iron, replied Passport who was busy preparing a hasty breakfast. At noon, the guide gave the signal to the starting. In the country soon assu assumed a very wild aspect. To the large forest succeeded corps, uh, copses of tamarinds and dwarf palms and vast arid plains, bristling with scant scanty shrubs, strewn with large blocks of cyanites. All this part of in Upper Bundelkhand, very little visited travelers, inhabited by the fanatical population, hardened by the most terrible practices of Hindu religion. The government of British could have been regularly established over a territory subjected to the influence of Rajas, whom it had been very difficult to reach their inaccessible retreats in the Vindhas. They were descending their last declivities of the Vindhas, <coughs> and Kuruni. <coughs> resumed his rapid gait. Towards noon, the guide went around the village of Callenger, situated on Kani, one of the tr tributes of Ganges, and he always avoided inhabited places, feeling himself safer in those deserts, open stretches of countries, <clears throat> which marks of first depression of basin of the <clears throat> river. Halabad was not Twelve miles to the northeast, halts was made under clumps of twelve banana trees whose fruit was as healthy as bread. A succulent as cream, travelers say, was very much appreciated. <clears throat> At two o'clock, the guide entered the shelter of the thick, for thick forest, and he had to traverse for a space of several miles. He preferred to travel thus under the cover of wood. <clears throat> and... All events, up to this moment, there had been no unpleasant meeting, and it seemed as if the journey would be accomplished without accident, when the elephant, showing some signs of easiness, suddenly stopped. <clears throat> What's the matter? <clears throat> it was four o'clock. <clears throat> What's the matter? asked Sir Francis Cromarty, raising his head <clears throat> above his howdah. I do not know, officer, replied Percy, listening to the confused murmur which came through the thick branches. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. A few moments after, this murmur became more defined. It might have been called a concert, still very distant, <clears throat> and uh, human voices and brass instruments. Passepartout was all eyes, all ears. F Fogg waited patiently without uttering a word. The Parsi jumped down, fastened the elephant to a tree, and plunged into the thickest of undergrowth. A few minutes later, he retained... <clears throat> He returned, saying, A Brahmin procession is coming this way. If it is possible, let us avoid being seen. The guide unfastened the elephant, led him to the thicket, rec recommending the travelers not to descend. He held himself ready to mount the elephant quickly, should flight become necessary, but he thought that the troop of the 
<coughs> a faithful would pass without noticing him, for the thickness of their foliage <coughs> entirely concealed him. The discordant noise of voices and instruments approached. Monotonous chants were mingled with the <coughs> sound of drums and cymbals, and soon the head of the procession appeared from the trees. <coughs> After fifty paces from the spot occupied by Mr. Fogg and his companions, and through the branches they ready distinguished the curious personnel of the religious ceremony. The first line of priests in matches upon their heads and attired in long robes adorned with gold and silver lace. They were surrounded by men, women, and children who were singing a sort of funeral psalmody, interrupted at in regular intervals by the beating of tom-toms and cymbals. Behind them on a car, a large wheel whose spokes and fellows represented ser serpents intertwined, appeared a hideous statue drawn by two of richly <coughs> carapassoned zebuses. This statue had four arms, and its body colored with a dark red, its eyes haggard, and its hair tangled, its tongues hanging out, its lips colored with henna and betel, its neck was encircled by a collar of skulls, and round its waist a girdle of human hands. It was erect upon a prostrate giant, whose head was missing. <clears throat> Sir Francis Cromartie recognized the statue. The goddess Kalai, he murmured, the goddess of love, of death, I would grant, but love... Never, replied in Passport 2, the ugly old woman. The Parsi made him a sign to keep quiet. The, around the statue was a group of old figures, jumping and tossing themselves around about convulsively, smeared with bands of ochre. <coughs> They're <coughs> covered with cross-like cuts. Once their blood escaped drop by drop, stupid fanatics, who in the great cer ceremonies participate themselves under the weir of the juggernaut, and <clears throat> behind them, some Brahmins, all in magnificent oriental costumes, were dragging a woman who could hardly hold herself erect. This woman is young, as fair as a European, her head, her neck, her shoulder, her <clears throat> ears, her arms, her hands, and her toes were loaded with jewels, necklaces, bracelets, earrings, and finger rings, and a tunic embroidered with gold, <clears throat> covered with light muslin, <clears throat> and displayed the outlines of her form. Behind this young woman, a violent contrast for the eyes were guards, armed with naked sabers, fastened to their girdles as long, dominant pistols. Carrying a corpse upon a panaquin. The body was an old man dressed in rich garments of Raja, having, as in the life, his turbans embroidered with pearls, his robe <coughs> woven of silk and gold, his uh, sash of cashmere ornamented with diamonds, and his magnificent arms as an Indian prince. The musicians and rear guard of fanatics, whose cries sometimes drowned the deafening noise of instruments, closed up the cortege. <coughs> Francis Sir Francis Camardi looked up at the pomp and the singular sad air, turning to the guide, and he said, A suti, said, the Parsi made him a affirmative sign and put his fingers on his lips, and the prolonged procession came out of the trees, and soon the last bit of it disappeared into the depths of the forest. Little by little, the chanting died out. There were still sounds of distant cries, and finally a profound silence succeeded all this tumult. Yeah, Phileas Fogg heard the word uttered by Cromarty. As soon as the procession had disappeared, he asked, What is a suti? A suti, Mr. Fogg, replied the Brigadier General, is a human sacrifice. But a voluntary sacrifice. The woman that you have seen will be burned tomorrow in the earlier part of the days. Oh, the villain, replied the passport <clears throat> who would not pro prevent this cry of indignation. In this corpse, it is that of the prince, her husband, replied the guide. An independent Raja of Bundelkhand. How, replied Phileas Fogg, without his voice betraying the least emotion, do these barbarous customs still exist in India? Have not the British able to exerpitate them? In the largest part of India, replied Sir Francis Cromartie, these sacrifices do not come to pass. We have no influence over these wild countries, in particular over this country of Bundelkhand. All the northern slopes of Indaha is the scene of murders and incessant robberies. But the unfortunate woman, murmured Passport 2, burned alive. Yes, replied the general, burned. And if she was not, you wouldn't believe what a miserable condition she would be reduced by her near relatives. They would shave her hair, they would scarcely feed her with a few handful of rice, they would repulse her. She would be considered as an unclean creature, and soon would die in some corner like a sick dog. So the prospect of this frightful ex existence frequently drives these unfortunate to the sacrifice much more than love or religious fanaticism.
Sometimes, however, the sacrifice is really just voluntary. The energetic intervention of the government is necessary to prevent it. Some years ago, I was living in Bombay when a young widow came to the government and asked his authorities for her to be burned with the body of her husband. As you may think, the government refused, but then the widow left the city, took the refugee with an independent raha, and she accomplished the sacrifice. During the narrative of the general, the guy shook his head, which he said, when he was through, he said, and The sacrifice which takes place tomorrow is not voluntary. How do you know? It's a story which everybody in Bundelkhand knows, replied the guy. But this unfortunate did not seem to make any resistance. Remarked the Sir Francis Camardi, because she was intoxicated with the fumes of hemp and optium. But where are they taking them? To the Bogota of Fajai, two miles from here. She will pass the night in waiting for the sacrifice. And the sacrifice will place at the first appearance of day. After this answer, the guide brought the elephant out of the dense thicket, jumped on his necks, and at the moment, he was going to start him off by a peculiar whistle. Mr. Fogg <coughs> stopped him and addressed his <coughs> surfacing Camardi, said, If we could save this woman, save this woman, Mr. Fogg, replied the Brigadier General. I still have twelve hours to spare. I can devote them to her. Why, you are a man of heart, said Sir Francis Camardi. Sometimes, replied Phileas Fogg simply, when I have time.